Joining me now to discuss all of this is Stephen Walt, Professor of International Relations at Harvard University and a columnist at Foreign Policy Magazine, Julia Yoffe, co-founder and DC correspondent for Puck News, and the former French ambassador to the United States, Gerard Aro. Thank you all for joining me this evening. Stephen, let me start with you. You tweeted out that Sun Tzu quote yesterday about building a golden bridge for your enemies. What does a golden bridge in Ukraine right now look like? And is it too soon to be talking about this, given we've only just started pressuring Putin? I don't think it's too early to start talking about it, in part because there's been these premature declarations of victory by some commentators in the West. It's clear that the Russian invasion has not gone as smoothly as Moscow had hoped. That's good news as well. And this has immediately been interpreted as some as sort of an opportunity to try and humiliate Russia as much as possible. And as you mentioned in your opening, uh, even some calls from people who should know better that what we should be pushing for is some kind of regime change, that the only solution here is the eventual removal of Vladimir Putin. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, gets uh, really major wars started. If you're trying to get Russia to turn around, you don't want to suggest that that's uh, what your objective is here. Our goal is to get Russia out of Ukraine in a way that satisfies uh, Ukrainians' desire to live independent, sovereign lives and minimizes the risk of war going forward. And if that requires us not uh, to humiliate Russia and to give them some face-saving ways out, then that's obviously in our interest. It's very much in Ukraine's interest because, of course, the longer this war goes on, the more damage okay. will be done to Ukraine more than anyone else. Julia, what is your response to Stephen's argument about offering a face-saving way out? We all want this war to end, and soon. What's the best way to do that, in your view? Well, I'm not sure, and I'm so glad that I'm not paid to, you know, find solutions. But I do agree with Professor Walt that, uh, you know, finding some kind of off-ramp, even at this stage, would be ideal. The question is, how is that possible? Because I think it's gotten harder. Um, the Golden Bridge has been there this entire time. The U.S. and uh, Europe, who have been trying to engage in diplomacy with Russia for the last two months at least, uh, have been trying to build this Golden Bridge for Russia, and Russia refused to retreat across it. And I think in part because what Putin wants, and I hate to use that phrase, but what Putin wants is something that we cannot give him. He wants Ukraine. And what was so interesting to me in this last week was that over the weekend, Russian uh, RIA, RIA News, which is a state um, news organization, published this long op-ed saying, hurrah, Ukraine has been conquered. Now uh, Russia is this, the, there's the Russian world. It's been reconstituted of great Russia, white Russia, Bel which is what Belarus means, or Belarus means, and little Russia, which is Ukraine. And now we can uh, counterbalance the Anglo-Saxon world. And of course, it seemed to be kind of jumping the gun and seemed like a piece that the Kremlin had planned to publish if its campaign had gone as planned, which we know it hasn't. So it seems that, you know, we got an insight yeah. into what they want. And like, I don't know what, if that's, if that's their goal here, what, what do we offer them? And if, that's and, a fair and, point. The other, and the, the other thing and I would say a... is that, sorry, can I just add <laughs> this point? The, yes. the other thing is that he has made EU membership and NATO membership, not just in Ukraine more popular, but in Finland more popular popular. Finland, which yes. has been neutral for this very reason for this long, uh, popular desire for NATO membership has shot through the roof. There was a poll that just came out today where over half of Finns now want to join Finland. Um, yes. And I, I, Julia, I spoke to the I spoke to the former Finnish prime minister yesterday on this show on MSNBC, and he was saying similar things, which I am going to return back to. But I'm going to bring in uh, Ambassador Aro. Uh, French President Emmanuel Macron has been in touch with Putin in recent days. Uh, Macron had a call with him earlier today, and his office said that Putin confirmed his willingness to commit on three points, stopping all strikes on civilians in Ukraine, preserving civilian infrastructure, and providing safe access to key roads. What should we make of this, Ambassador? Does France, does Europe more broadly, really see a diplomatic end to this conflict anytime soon? It doesn't look like that from the US, I know. No, you know, every crisis is moving by stages. And right now, we are in a stage where, on one side, the Russians can hope to get everything they want, 
it will be more, maybe more difficult, more painful than it was forecast. But nevertheless, right now, after six days of conflict, they can say, we'll really even, we'll take Kiev, we, we actually, we may, we may win. On the other side, the Ukrainians, you know, excited, I should say, uh, by uh, by the occasion, you know, by their uh, pride, national pride, are really want to fight. So, unfortunately, I think that, like it happens in any crisis, for the moment, we can't do a lot. We can't do a lot, but actually, we should be prepared when it's possible we should be prepared to try, you know, really to, to move both sides to the table of negotiation. And I think it's what Macron is trying to do. And he's, he's doing it with, actually, with the agreement of Zelensky. He's really to, 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 really to keep open a line of communication of, with, uh, with Putin. Stephen, you recently told the New York Times that you, quote, find it difficult to believe that any world leader, including Mr. Putin, would seriously contemplate using nuclear weapons for the simple reason that they understand the consequences. But you look at Putin, and it's also hard to see him as someone who's acting rationally right now. He's the one who's declaring a nuclear alert, not to mention this brazen illegal invasion in the first place. What are we supposed to believe when it comes to Putin's behavior, whether he's acting in his country's best interests, whether he's in a stable place right now? I mean, he's sitting at epically long tables miles away from his own financial and military advisors. Well, first of all, there are lots of uh, leaders of lots of countries who've made grotesque miscalculations that have damaged their countries in various ways. So uh, that doesn't mean that they would then contemplate the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and the only saving grace here is the fact that it doesn't take a genius, it doesn't take even a very stable person to realize what the use of nuclear weapons would begin to mean. And for that reason, I don't think there's a, a serious risk here. There is some danger, of course, and that's one of the reasons why the West, however uh, great the desire to punish Russia might be at this point, has to be careful. <laughs> After all, if uh, Putin is as uh, irrational as some people say he is, then the last thing you would want to do is absolutely corner them to start to talk about uh, matters of regime change. The other thing to bear in mind is this is very early in this process, right? And as Ambassador Aro said, uh, it's quite possible that Russia will be able to gain most of its military objectives in time. They have assets they have not used yet. Um, they, uh, the initial invasion has not gone particularly well, but no one should assume that they can't ultimately be militarily successful at great cost, uh, at great cost to Ukraine. And that means we have to start thinking about What's the kind of arrangement that would be acceptable to us, even if it's not what we would want? And I think the likely outcome here is that no one will ultimately get what they really wanted. Russia is clearly yeah. not getting a divided NATO. Russia is not getting a cheap, quick victory. Russia is not going to be able to dominate Ukraine, even if at some point they put a puppet regime in there. There are lots of ways in which Russia is going to fall short of what might have been their initial hopes and objectives. The point is that so, Ukraine may not get what it wants either. It may not get NATO membership because the solution to this will be ultimately some kind of armed neutrality for Ukraine. And the United States may not get everything it might want in all of this as okay. well. Uh, usually when you get a protracted conflict, the only way to solve it is by everyone agreeing to get a little bit less than they might have initially wanted or initially a very, hoped. A very fair point. Julie, I want to pick up on a point Stephen just made a moment ago about, you know, you can't say he's a rational guy and an irrational guy at the same time. He's both a hawk who wants to fight, but he's someone we can intimidate at the same time. I used to hear the same debate around Iran. It's, they're crazy, they're going to bomb us, but we can sanction them into the ground and they won't respond. And I worry when I hear Adam Kinzinger saying, we can bring in a no-fly zone, but, you know, he's not going to respond because we kill Russians in Syria. Like, either he is going to lash out and, God forbid, use nukes, or he's not as threatening as we're told he is. Which, which one is it? Do you see the kind of confusion that I'm identifying? Yeah, and I think it's because often what, what we mean when we say somebody is not rational, we mean they don't think like us. And Putin certainly doesn't think like Americans do, but he is rational within his own parameters. It's just like we're in base 10 and he's in base 12. He is rational within, again, his logical framework. And that's what worries me, is that in his framework, 
he doesn't have a lot to lose. And he didn't take many of the off ramps that were offered to him within the last two months. There wasn't even, you know, there were, there were many dipl diplomatic meetings, but not really serious negotiate negotiations went on. If anything, he used them then as a pretext to say, look, we tried and now we're invading Ukraine. And now I worry that because the, precisely because his uh, invasion isn't going well, that he will escalate, um, because the West punished him, but didn't really have an option to not punish him for doing this, that he yeah. will continue to escalate. I worry that he will turn Kiev into Grozny. I worry that, you know, we saw Kharkiv, we saw um, cluster munitions being used on civilian areas. You know, he's clearly stepping things up in a, and playing far more dirty and uh, beginning to bomb civilian areas in a way that they were clearly avoiding earlier. Yeah. Um, and that's what I'm worried about, because in that very rational framework, he cannot lose this. He cannot be humiliated by what he sees as little Russia, as a little country in his view, with a fake uh, independence, which should be part of Russia. And I worry that he, I mean, we don't know if he will use a nuclear war, a weapon or not. Like, we hope he won't. No. It's likely, but it doesn't mean he won't. That's a good point. Because he, he does not want to be humiliated here. He will not lose this. That's a good point. It's, it's a scary time. Last question to you, Ambassador, on something more broader, which is the EU has been acting very graciously, uh, responsibly with this influx of Ukrainian refugees, rightfully so. France, your country, which heads the EU Council presidency, is proposing that the bloc adopt a temporary protection directive, which would grant those fleeing the conflict immediate and temporary protection. There's talk of the EU asking for three years uh, residency for Ukrainian refugees. But this is coming from a country, France, whose leader, President Macron, back in August last year, said France had to protect itself from a wave of migrants from Afghanistan. Poland and Hungary opened borders to Ukrainians, but closed them to Afghans and Syrians. Many would say, what is that if not straight up racism? No, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good point. You know, uh, there, were, there, are, there are a lot of discussions on the French media. It's on, on that. And I think on European media, because France is not, as you, you, point, you pointed out, uh, France, Poland, Hungary, but also other European countries are reacting the same. I think, and it's not a way of condoning it or approving it, the fact is that uh, the, European, the Europeans feel closer to Ukrainians who are Europeans to people from other continent. You can say it's a shame, but that's a fact. It's really the way public opinions are reacting, uh, are reacting today. It's a fair point. I take what you're saying, uh, but it's also a fact then that when European countries said there's no space for people to come in here, there's no resources, that wasn't true. There is space and resources when it's people who look like you, as you're conceding. Oh, of course. You know, really, I, I, I wouldn't defend, uh, you know, the idea of saying we, can't, we take Ukrainians and we don't take Afghans. You know, really, you know, uh, also, like in your own country, like in the U.S., how much immigration has become a sort of a toxic topic and which is used by the far right, how, much, how powerful yes. the far right is everywhere. And the fact is, by the way, that uh, the French are going to elect a new president in six weeks. So obviously, uh, it's, it's, it's a factor. In, it, it is indeed. Interesting times. Stephen Walt, Julia Yoffe, and Ambassador Gerard Oro, thank you all for a fascinating conversation. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.